Good morning, Facebook. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, Mike. We're trying a little different um, method of recording today if the sound is good could someone just give me a thumbs up or say yes thank you thank you vicky want to remind all of our uh, Facebook congregation that the um, cookbooks are on sale now. They're $15 a piece and if you are interested in getting one of those you can send an email to uh, River Valley Cookbook at yahoo.com and just includes your phone number or your uh, address and uh, we'll get back with you on how to get that all taken care of. Good morning. Good morning. And um, you missed a wonderful, wonderful trunk or treat yesterday here on the property. Uh, we had a lot of kids show up and had such a good time and uh, had a parking lot full of adults that were also equally having a wonderful time. So. It's just really great to worship with such lovely people. Hi, how are you? Good. Good morning, let's all stand together, please. Let's stand together and sing.
Father, you are holy. You are above our ways. You, Lord, are so worthy of all the praise we can give you and so much more. Father, we pray today that uh, as we lift our voices and sing, that Father, uh, you might find our words, our songs, our thoughts, our prayers pleasing. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon your church today. Invigorate us, get us ready for a new week to go out and serve you and bring you more glory and honor and praise. Father, thank you for Christ, the one who died for us. And we pray in his name. Amen. Sing along with me, please. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way, let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began.
Jesus, by his death on the cross, has arrested, has stopped, has ended death in our lives when we're in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord and uh, sing about his beauty, sing about his grace. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No ear has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you Oh, 
kids till after communion, by the way. Just ignore that for a minute there. So, um, yeah. Um, come on back, Joey. <laughs> um, I remember hearing years ago, somebody ran a computer simulation and uh, some kind of model, and they took just eight of the prophecies from the Old Testament about Christ. Just eight. There are many, 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 many more of them, but eight prophecies um, from the Old Testament regarding the Christ as revealed in the New Testament, and the odds of those eight happening to one person uh, would be as if you had taken um, quarters uh, and covered the entire state of Texas, it's a pretty big state, two feet deep in these quarters, then put someone in an airplane with a parachute on, told them to tell them to jump out whenever they want, and when they land, they're gonna pick up one quarter, and that would be the quarter that had an X marked on it of all those quarters. That, I don't know what that is in numbers, but that's got to be astronomically high. Well, speaking of those prophecies of Christ, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, when you see just those eight and there are many others that how can a person be born and have all these things occur to them? Many of them occurred to him. He had no control over, like his bones not being broken, his legs not being broken on the cross. That was prophesied. He had no control over that situation, but it came true that way. Um, we look at all these prophecies and their fulfillment and truly that scripture comes to mind that says the fool says in his heart there is no God but let's look at one of those prophecies it's often called the very first one of Christ it happens way back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 it talks about the um, the results of the fall of man when Adam and Eve uh, ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, God has some things to say to Adam. He has some things to say to Eve. And he has some things to say to the serpent. And he says the serpent, he would eat the dust of the earth. It talked about the offspring of the woman. This is years later. It talked about how her offspring, that Satan would bruise his heel, but that he would crush Satan's head. It's fulfilled on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. It was like a, a wound to the heel to him. He died, but he was raised by the power of the Spirit on the third day. And the God of peace crushed Satan underneath his feet, as another scripture says. In so doing, he purchased our salvation and defeated our enemies, sin, the grave, hell, death, Satan. Thanks be to God for the victory that is ours through Jesus Christ. As we meet around the Lord's table today, let's thank God that prophecies came true. A Redeemer was born. Emmanuel, God with us, who died for us. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you for the Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One, Jesus. Thank you for your, your wisdom, bringing him to this world in the fullness of time. And in a way that no one else could dream of. In just the perfect way. Lord, thank you for bringing him here purpose of dying for our sins, of paying the penalty so that we don't have to. What a good God you are. How amazing is your love. How wonderful is your grace. How thrilling it is to know Christ did this for us. Lord, let us humbly, with great thanksgiving, today partake of the loaf and the cup, symbols of Christ's body and blood, knowing that our salvation was bought at a terrible price, the death of the Christ. Lord, how beautiful he is. Thank you for Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.
how children can believe at this time for their teaching. And uh, last week we talked about the children uh, who came to Christ and he wanted us to welcome them as if we were welcoming him. I'd like for you to stand right now. I know we've had a sacred moment with the Lord in communion. Would you commune with one another and welcome someone nearby you in Jesus' name? Thank you for coming and please welcome another. How are you? I was wondering where you were and then I seen you come up. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? is our, our scripture text, Matthew 19, 16. Uh, listen carefully. I'm not going to read the entire 12 verses, but I'll read what uh, I, 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 I will preach on, and then the rest I'll add to as well. Now, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good, and he was referring to God, and we just sang about the beautiful one, but Jesus called him the good one. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. The man inquired, which ones? And Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all these I have kept, what still do I lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, you go and you sell your possessions and you give it all to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. Keep your finger in that passage. I'm going to preach on the other verses that follow that. How many of you have heard that story before? Thank you. Good. Well, that's great because it's repeated two other times in the Gospels. It's repeated in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, and Luke 18, verses 18 to 30. But Jesus said something pretty profound. How many of you remember the old commercial when E.F. Hutton speaks? Everybody, Everybody listens. Now, if that was true of E.F. Hutton, how much more when Jesus speaks should we listen? Jesus here is talking a little bit about money, certainly about stewardship of life, talking about keeping the commandments. And I believe we need to listen to Jesus if we want to follow him. Now, I, I, I want to look at who he talked to in Matthew 9 16. Jesus talked to a man about eternal life. How many of you here would like to have eternal life? I do. I do. I want to live forever in the presence of God. Verse 16, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, there's three things I think you can see in this uh, story. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that he was rich, wealthy. Now, we don't know how he got his wealth. He could have been the ancient version of Mark Zuckerberg, or who was an entrepreneur <laughs> at an early age and made a fortune hardly before he was old enough to look like he even shakes. <laughs> 
Maybe he invented high-speed laptop sundials or new fuel-efficient chariots that get 50 miles a bucket of oats. <laughs> what did he do? More than likely, he got his wealth the old-fashioned way. He inherited it. He got it from somebody else who left it for him. Well, we don't know. All we know is this man was rich. Now, if you listen carefully, it also identifies in Matthew he was young. We're not told how old he is, but given the standards of the day and these who were coming to Jesus, we, we think many of them were young, maybe in their 20s and 30s. And isn't that a great time of life to be following Jesus? Now, I don't know about you, uh, yesterday we gathered and we did the hokey pokey out there as a group and I'm a little sore from doing that today, so I'm not <laughs> sure what the 20s or 30s feel like. I know what the 60s do. Some of us have difficulty remembering our younger days of adulthood. Some of us try to straighten, straighten out the wrinkles in our socks, and then we discover we aren't wearing any. <laughs> Some of us wake up looking like we wished we looked on our driver's license we carry around. Some of us think back to the days where we lifted weights, and for us, just standing up is a lot of weight to lift. <laughs> And some of us know we are no longer young because everything hurts and what doesn't hurt just doesn't work. <laughs> well, what we see, the Bible say about this fellow, he was a young man. And he was rich. And as a young day man, we, we think he probably has many good days ahead to follow the Lord if he would choose to do so. The third thing we see is he was influential. In Luke 19, we, we find him to be a, a, a ruler, a, a leader in the community. He's not given a name, so some people often just call him the rich young ruler. Oscar Wilde once wrote, there are two tragedies in this life. One is getting what one wants, and the other is not get it. You know what? He, he was torn. He had so many good things in his life, but something was missing as wealthy as he was at a young age. He must have had things he wanted, but he didn't have everything he needed. And because something was missing, he did something good. He went to Jesus. And I think that's wise. There's two truths I want to point out to us. None of us at any age, young or old, have it all together. We tend to see that something is missing, and we all need Jesus. If that's true of you, would you say amen? Amen. I need Jesus. I hope you do. And the second truth is, if we're going to need Jesus, we've got to come to Jesus because he's the greatest of all teachers of all time. And that's what he said, teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? And I want you to go to Jesus to find that truth. Well, I hope we're here today to gain that truth. Matthew 19, 16, Jesus talks to a man about God. And then he talks about eternal life, eternal matters. Look what he said, teacher, what good thing must I do? to get eternal life. Jesus replied, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And that's a mention to his heavenly father, God, the Jewish people's Jehovah, the one who provides, the one who protects. He is the one who is good. If you want to enter life, eternal life, you keep the commandments. And that was a good answer for those living under the, the Old Testament law. 
But what the question is, it, it, it's not a, a academic question. It's a personal question. What do I need to do to get eternal life? And he came to Jesus seeking that which would be eternal. Maybe he didn't understand just yet that eternal life is not just something far off after we die. Eternal life really is right now, through death, and then beyond. And so there is a quality of life here on earth we're grasping for that will be eternal life that starts right now, goes through death, and then into the presence of the Lord. I think we all seek that. There, there are those who have thought about this, who have looked at life. Augustine once said, our hearts were made for God and are forever restless until they find their rest in him. Pascal said, we have a God-shaped vacuum in our souls that only he can fill. There, there, there tends to be something missing in our life if we pursue this life only to satisfy ourselves. There's something bigger in life than just me, me, me. And so the rich young ruler asked a personal question that we probably all ought to ask. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, living in the day of Christ before his death, living under the Mosaic law, he asked the question that, that was framed just like any other religion. It's a common misunderstanding. Religions are based on the premise that if we could do the right thing in the right way, we could find the secret to eternal life. And so different religions, if you want to investigate them, I, I had a class in Bible college on the different religions to get just a basis of understanding of what they teach and practice and how it compares to Christianity and why living for Christ is better. But different religions have different rituals and different rules, but they're all built on the erroneous principle that you earn heaven by what you do. What you do. And the rich young ruler asked that. What good must I do to gain eternal life? And he hadn't yet quite caught the gospel truth. The start of the new covenant. The new commandment. The new testament. Which came from Jesus in John 3.16. That proclaims our good God has sent his one and only son. And that our relationship to eternal life is belief in Jesus. Faith that he has been sent from God. But it gets better than that. Romans 5.8 says, Our good God demonstrated his love in this manner. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that yet had not been performed. And so they're still living under the old law. And he gave an answer that was accurate to the old teaching. So Jesus responds to the man with a question, why do you ask about what is good? There is only one who is good, and it's God alone. Seek to be like him. And Jesus knows that the kingdom of heaven is about inheriting eternal life through what God has done for us, not what we do for him. And that's a big difference between religions and following Christ. And so until the cross and until the atonement is realized, Jesus is still living under the Old Testament law. And he says, if you want to gain eternal life, you start by keeping the commandments. And it's a noble thing to do the good things Jesus identified. Uh, the, the, there was a great preacher named uh, Charles Wesley who said this. Do all the good you can in all the places you can to all the people you can as long as you have their king. And that's a good principle of life. And those of us who follow Christ would be good to honor that and live that way. Well, when 
He heard about keeping the commandments. The rich young ruler responded, which ones? Which commandments? And then Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testament. You should honor your father and mother. You should love your neighbors yourself. And if you heard that from Christ, you think if that young man can do that, he's going to live forever. He's going to be in the presence of God. It's just our inclination will settle for being good. And yet, we learn through Christ there's something better. Notice that Jesus only lifts commandments 6, 7, 8, 9. Then he backs up to number 5. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Why didn't he say 10? And why didn't he say the first four? Which talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Is it possible that this young man lived and hadn't broken any of the commandments that he did speak of? If I was to go through the Ten Commandments now, how many of them could you say you have never broken? Now just think through that. Could you get four or five that you've never broken? I did it one time, and I got to what I guess is two, but I'm not going to tell you which the other eight are. <laughs> I just know I'm not a very good guy. I need a Savior. I need to ask this great teacher, how do I get eternal life? And under the old law, the only thing they had was to let that show you you weren't very good. And what he does is say, oh, I think I'm good enough. Is there anything more? And so he goes, I've done that. Guess I get the clearing house sweet sex. I guess I get eternal life. Is there anything that I'm lacking? And he says, uh, if you want to be perfect, not just good. If you want to be perfect, you go. You sell all your possessions. You give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and then you come follow me. You know, there have been people who have chosen a monastic life, and they've lived on a mountain, and they got rid of all possessions, and, and they tried to connect with God that way. And uh, that still is not what Jesus meant. You know, there is a verse in the New Testament, James 1.27, where it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. You look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep yourself pure, unpolluted from the world. If you could do it, that would be a pure religion. But how many of us can even do that? If you want to be perfect in your religion, if you want to do what you, you would do in order to be as close to perfection as possible, you give it all up. You sell all your possessions. And it's as if Jesus is saying to get eternal life under the old law. You, you can do good, but to be perfect, you've got to give it all away. Do not settle just to get by. The absolute greatest thing is sell it all, give it to the poor. And why would you do that? Why would Jesus propose that? I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm just wondering, as Jesus is standing before him as God in the flesh, is it possible that he's saying you need to be like God, who asked his one and only son to give it all up from heaven, to come to earth, to have no place to lay your head as you're going to the cross? For the sins of the world of others. Then. Then. If you're like me. You'll be perfect. I, I'm not sure. Sometimes I don't have all the answers. But I'm just wondering if Jesus is asking the question. Would you let your money stand between you and God. And a chance for eternal life. A little bit given away or all of it. Some of you know the old comedian Jack Benny. I, I used to watch him and 
there was a little routine he had one time. He, he was known to be a very miserly man, had a great amount of wealth, but he was stingy, quite honestly. And there's a little act he did on the stage one time. A robber came out dressed with a mask, and he had a gun, and he yelled out to Benny, your money or your life. Benny just stood there. The robber said it again, your money or your life. And he just kind of stood there, then he kind of tapped his cheek. He said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> and Benny wasn't about to give his money to somebody else. Is it possible that the rich young ruler was kind of in that same predicament, your money or your life, and he just couldn't give it up if that was the standard for protection and perfection? Jesus had said on the Sermon on the Mount, I don't know if he heard it or not, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, we know Jesus does talk about money. It isn't taboo to him. But I think he talks about money because he knows the pursuit of wealth can cause a person to ignore God undervalue family, treat people unkindly, and cause some to engage in a host of destructive activities that create barriers between them and God. And so in verse 22, wherever this young man was when he asked this question and he got the honest answer from Jesus while living under the old law. And remember, under the old law, when the young man heard this from Jesus, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Let me read that verse 22 again. When the young man heard this question from Jesus, the answer from Jesus, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Most of you know Colonel Sanders made an awful lot of money with that finger licking good chicken. <laughs> he had money galore. But even the colonel realized and taught people there's no good reason to be the richest man in the cemetery. Amen. Can't take it with you. Right. Billy Graham said, there won't be a U-Haul following your hearse. Right. You can't take it with you. This rich man walked away with all his wealth, couldn't see life on earth through death and not see it as it yet was with his possessions. He might have thought he could die and take it with him. Don't do that. Don't believe that. And so at this point in the story, John MacArthur says Jesus wanted his followers, his disciples to learn a good lesson from a bad example who walked away from Jesus. Don't let money keep you from God. Now, let's finish what I didn't read by looking at verse 23. Now Jesus has the man walk away, and now he talks to his followers. And here's where I hope we can uh, feel at peace. Jesus, well, not really peace, but we're always going to struggle with what Jesus says. Uh, we're going to fight ourselves to do what he says. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Rich people struggle with God. Have you ever noticed that rich people struggle with God? There's a point I'm trying to make. That rich people struggle with God, the wealthy heiress, Jackie Onassis, former first lady, former wife of oil baron and multi-millionaire, once said, happiness is not based on money, and the greatest proof of that is my family. Elvis Presley, just before his death, was asked by a reporter, you always wanted great wealth, success, and fame, and to be happy. Are you happy? 
And just months before his, he died, reportedly he replied, no, I'm as lonely as if I'm in hell. And you know he didn't find happiness. He sought other coping methods than turning to God. People without money often think that money can buy them happiness. And people with money often realize that it just doesn't. The Wall Street Journal said money is an article which can be used as a universal passport to everywhere but heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven and you can't give enough of it away. But one thing that can close the door of heaven is our pursuit of money and greed and we can close the applause we can get one day. And so Jesus talked to his disciples about making sure we didn't rely on money. We relied on God. The second thing I want you to see in verse 25. If you can advance the slide there, they'll see this second point with me. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Man can't possibly save himself. Only God can. This is what he's trying to teach for us who will follow Christ both in the Old and the New Testament. Soon and very soon, Jesus, God in the flesh, would pay the debt he didn't owe because we had a debt we couldn't pay. Jesus was going to go to the cross and then we could be perfect if we believed in Jesus and allowed his shed blood to cover our sins. And when God looks at us, we are just as if we never sinned. Only then will we ever be able to attain a, protect, a perfection that pleases God. And we achieve that when Christ paid the ultimate price that launches this new good news. Peter answered, okay, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, that's in the era of eternal life, when the Son of Man sits on the throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. And I think he's referring to the 12 apostles. We'll sit on 12 thrones. And they'll judge the tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left here, here's where he's speaking to us. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And he's talking about believing in him, following him, and making some sacrifice. Man can make some sacrifice for God's kingdom, and then God will pour out his blessings as much as a hundredfold in this life and more so in the life to come. And so the question is, what will you do with what you have now? for God and others. Most of us live with a knack of self-preservation, but Jesus challenged his followers to choose to invest in endeavors that preserve others' eternal salvation. My favorite poem, I heard it years ago, if you can remember this, one day, if you want to put it on my gravestone, here's what I want there. When I get to that wonderful city and the saints around me appear, I want somebody to say, it was you who invited me here. Amen. My whole life is I'm wanting to be sure at least one gets to heaven because of what I've done. Would you stand with me? I want you to watch a video here. Watch this video. There's others who have the same Hi guys, Tom Franklin here. I'd like to invite you to River Valley Christian Church each and every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We have always have a good uh, service and a good uh, service right out of the Bible. That's the main thing for the church. And also, on the 15th of November, we'll be hosting the White River Christian 
fellowship meeting with the kids court and the weekday religious education for all in Morton County. That's a very important thing to teach these youngsters about Jesus at your grade school days. I did it when I was young and I still remember it and I know it sticks with you. So come on out and enjoy. River Valley is a great friendly church. We love it. We know you will too if you'll just step inside those doors. Thank you so much. Tom Franklin is here with you here in the you know, in the closing comment Jesus made, he said, many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. I, I've wrestled with that. What did he mean? I think he means there's many in the world who look like they're in first place, like the rich young ruler. But when they get to heaven, they're going to be in last place. And many of us who look like we're in last place. Maybe because we've given a lot up or, or sacrificed some for the kingdom of God. Now, when we get there, we're going to be in first place. That's good news. Amen. But the hardest thing in the world is to get us to let go of some of those good things we have, good things we've done, and let us be totally saved by God the Father through Jesus the Christ. Do you have trouble putting others first? I heard the story about a mom. She was preparing a breakfast. She made pancakes for two boys. Kevin was six and Tim was three. And the boys began to argue over the pancakes who would get the first one. Their mother saw the opportunity to teach a good lesson that would be straight from Jesus. And so she said, if Jesus was sitting here, Jesus would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. And Kevin blurted out, hey, Tim, why don't you be Jesus today? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Kevin has always had to learn to put others first, and he struggles with that. Do you as well? Let's don't be too harsh with the rich young ruler, because he couldn't put others first. And, and, and he did some good things, but he didn't, didn't do the thing that would make him perfect. And I don't think Jesus asked you to do the good thing that makes you perfect. He asked you to do the thing that allows him to make you perfect. Would you believe in me? Would you give some sacrifice of your life this side of heaven? Would you let the blood of Christ cover you so that you'll stand before God as if you were perfect one day and then you'll have blessing and the eternal life of being in the presence of the Father forever. That's a deal straight from Jesus. And that's what these apostles not only sacrificed their boats and their living, they, they left their hometown and they took it around the world. And River Valley has the same challenge to build friendships with people so that someday someone will be in heaven. Now, yesterday, if some of you were able to see that, I think we just got a little glimpse of heaven. We, we had a circle of cars out there. They decorated trunks. They bought cheap candy. And they gave it to kids. And somebody asked how many people came. I do not know, but I wouldn't be surprised if a hundred or more children came. And we just gave a little candy here, a little candy there, trying to say this is just a foretaste of what one day we would be if we just understand what the Bible says. That's why Tom made the invitation. Keep coming. Keep learning. Keep following Jesus. And in his time, by faith in Jesus, you will gain eternal life. You've heard about Jesus. It's not easy. It's not easy to understand all he's teaching. Put it into place and then put it and to practice right. I'm a living testimony of that. But I've heard enough that I do believe Jesus is God's son. Jesus gave his life. He wants to be our savior. He is the Messiah, as Ken said. He is the risen Lord. He is in heaven and he is coming again one day. And there is a thing called eternal life we want to attain. If I want to, would I believe that and turn to God? Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Ask that the blood of Christ be applied to my life. Would I confess Christ? Would I be baptized? Would I allow what Christ has done be activated as my faith in Jesus so I can stand perfect before God one day? It 
seems like some things we're doing, but it's really all because of what God has already done. Would you believe? Would you act in faith? Would you follow Christ today? We ask you today, maybe right, right now, if you believe, if you want to turn to God, would you show that turning by coming down the aisle? Would you make a confession of Christ? Would you plan to be baptized if you haven't? Would you possibly, if you're already saved, you've, you've done these things of faith that Christ taught, would you make a partnership with us at River Valley? Confess Christ. Place membership. It's all about putting others first and yourself second that you might have the joy God wants for you. Would you come if you desire Christ at this time? Let every 
love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, which you say amen. 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 Can you be seated. Let me introduce you to these two ladies. Can I have you move this way to that way just a bit so Angela can come and get in the light too? <laughs> I'm so grateful to let you know about these two ladies. Uh, to my left is Linda Hadley. This is uh, Tony Hadley's mother. How many of you know Tony? Well, this is the one who made Tony uh, stay in line all his life <laughs> even until today. Uh, Linda is a faithful servant of God. She, she has uh, a leadership role in the community with churches of mission. And uh, they provide food and assistance to people in Morgan County, especially Martinsville. And some of you know we support them with every little bit we can. And she's trying to uh, uh, raise some of the food that we could give people for Thanksgiving in their basket. She's asking that River Valley uh, just give stuffing. And all other churches that are being asked will give other ingredients and together we'll make Thanksgiving meals for uh, people of the community. We have until November 20th to give stuffing. If you don't want to give the stuffing or go to the store to get it, maybe the donation, I think, of a dollar to a dollar and a half will buy one of these. If you can uh, drop that in the... Uh, we've got a, a, a container out on the Welcome Center. She's brought the first one to prime the pump from River Valley. <laughs> but she also today is letting you know she wants to place her membership with us. And I think that's such a great thing. Would you Amen. Tony, Tony uh, came to the church with his children that, a number of years ago, and and uh, Tony continues to serve in the sound booth, uh, and uh, he's a great asset, and uh, she is a great leader of faith, and she can help us here too. Amen. Would you make a confession of faith in Jesus? I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. Son of the Living God. He is my Lord and Savior. He is my Lord. Amen. And uh, she's not a rich young ruler, but she's starting to give what she's got to advance the kingdom of God and help introduce others to the king of all kings. So if you can help us, please remember to do that. And I'll let you put that back out there uh, again later. Uh, and you model for us what we can give to churches of mission to help people locally. Uh, on my right is Angela Smith, and Angela is a longtime member here, but she's here to represent uh, Barbara Alexander, her aunt. Uh, Barbara Alexander is a charter member who joined our church 17 years ago next Sunday. Did you realize it'll be next Sunday, our 17th anniversary? And Barbara came to church. She had never, I've never met Barbara before that first Sunday. And I remember her walking in the church. And she, she said, I'm just so scared. My stomach is turning. I, I, but I just wanted to come to the first day of church. Mm -hmm. And she walked in the door. And she met a person, Joe Cooper, who was a classmate of her from high school. And he welcomed her and made her feel like Jesus. And you know what? After the preaching that very first day, she joined the church as a new member Amen. Uh, from the very first day till the present. Then Barbara became our first custodian, and she served until she had a stroke, I'm going to say seven or eight years ago. And Angela has been a caregiver to her aunt, and she's got a message from Barbara. Barbara wanted me to tell everybody hello. She told me this morning before I left. Oh, my. Tell everybody so, hello. What a sweet spirit Barbara has. And you can see caregiving has a, a burden on Angela's life. But she's a testimony that she's taking care of her aunt. And uh, God bless you for being Jesus to her. Thank you for taking care of that child. Amen. 
won't you stand with me right now? A lot of good things going on. Tom told you about a new thing that's going to happen uh, November 15th. Is that right, Tom? 15th? We're going to have uh, a meal here for the White River Christian Fellowship, which we did in March as well, but the church that was uh, designated in November has asked to be relieved this month, maybe next year. They can pick it up again. We're just pitching in, and we're going to do it again, all to the glory of God, and that is a great thing to do. And Margaret, would you like to make a statement? Yes, I just want to let everyone know that the cookbook is done, and it can be ordered online. Um, you can uh, send an email to rivervalleycookbook at yahoo.com, or you can get a hold of Bill or Kathy Gross Close. Um, we can take payment through PayPal, we can take a check, or we can take cash, and we also have a table every Sunday morning, so if you're coming to services, you can just order it right here, and that should be here by Thanksgiving, so if you want to get that as a gift also, it's going to be a great gift, it's a great book, so just want to let everyone know. It's Sunday, 17th anniversary, would you tell somebody to come celebrate, we're going to have a meal right after church, everybody likes to eat, don't you? <laughs> Father, thank you for this good church, people who are trying to be sure somebody says uh, we invited them there. Father, we all want eternal life. We know it's only possible through our faith in you and your son, the good God who sent his good son to give eternal life hope by giving his life on Calvary. Father, we plead that you would shed the blood on all of us. Keep forgiving us of our sin. Father, may we turn to you constantly for guidance, for your teaching. May we share that good news with others that we don't have to be perfect, but that you through Christ can make us as if we were. Father, thank you for our faith. Thank you for those who've repented. Thank you for the one who confessed Christ today. Father, I pray for more to be baptized. I pray that many would let uh, the blood of Christ cover them by their faith in Jesus. Father, just now use this church as we depart. May we be doing good wherever we go. Thank you for this day of worship. And we hope what we've shared has been pleasing in your sight. And it is in Jesus' holy name I pray. And all his people say, Amen. Amen.